This video lecture marks the beginning of a unit that attempts to explain the evolution of the idea of the atom. It'll take two chapters to discuss the earlier models of what we call atomic theory, um, and chapter four and chapter five. Chapter four covers the early models of the atom, and chapter five uh, discusses the more modern ideas of what the atom looked like. So these five pictures that you see right here are the five models that we are going to explore over the next two chapters. This video lecture, however, is going to cover chapter four, sections one and two. And that's going to, we're going to talk about the Dalton model, the Thompson model, and the Rutherford model of the atom, and the experiments that were used to clarify our ideas and our, our theories on what we thought the atom looked like. Starting back in ancient Greece, the idea of the atom existing originally came from a Greek philosopher named Democritus. He theorized, thought experiment, that if you took a grain of sand and you continually cut it in half and cut it in half again and cut it in half again, at some point you would get to a point where that grain of sand could no longer be cut. And he, he coined that particle atomos, the Greek word that means not to be cut. If you were to look at the root words, tom is a word that means to cut, and a is the negation of that concept. So A means not. So a tomos means not to be cut. Interestingly enough, tom, T-O-M, is a root word that is used in tomography, which is the T in the CAT scan, the computer-assisted tomography. Um, since a CAT scan is essentially layers and layers and layers of pictures of what's inside a person. So tome is the Greek word for cut. Atom or atom is not to be cut. That's the etymology of that word. There was another Greek philosopher, Aristotle, who conceptualized that various elements had to exist. His idea of elements, however, were not at all like the elements that we see on the periodic table today. All substances were made of four elements, according to Aristotle, the fire, air, earth, and water, and that every substance that currently existed was some combination of those four elements. This idea was carried on for centuries by alchemists, and it wasn't until the 1800s, 1900s, that those ideas of elements um, started to change. Fast forward to the early 1800s, John Dalton was a school teacher who combined this concept that elements existed with the idea that atoms, particles existed into what we call Dalton's atomic theory. Dalton's atomic theory has several parts to it. The first part says that all matter is made up of chemically indivisible particles called atoms. Indivisible, of course, means you cannot break them down. You cannot break down. And so each one of these particles, according to Dalton, is an atom. The second part of his atomic theory says that atoms of the same element are identical, but atoms of different elements are different. So here we see element A being these indivisible particles that are colored blue, but element B also has indivisible particles, but those indivisible particles are different than the particles over here on the left side of the page. The next part of Dalton's theory says that uh, atoms of different elements can physically mix as you see in the picture on the left, here you see elements B and A physically together in the same container, but they're not attached, they're not combined. They're just in the container side by side. 
That's a physical mixture. But he said that atoms of different elements could also chemically combine in whole number ratios to form compounds. So here we have this element A chemically attached to element B, and they are stuck together. Now you have this whole new unit that moves together as one particle, but that one particle is made up of atoms of different elements. And that combination is in a whole number ratio. In this instance, there are two element A's to every one element B. Those are the whole number ratio being two to one, of course. Another part of Dalton's atomic theory says that chemical reactions involve the rearrangement of atoms. No new atoms are created or destroyed. So here we see a particle on the left right here. We see a particle that is made up of three different elements. Here's one element. Here's a second element and the third element. There are three atoms of that third element. Now they're all attached around the centrally located uh, element shown here by the solid color of black, but chemically these can be broken apart and rearranged so that you still end up with the same inventory. You still have the one completely black atom over here. You have the one, two, three gray shaded atoms, and then you have the one larger atom over here. If you count it up, it's still five different individual atoms, but they're rearranged into different molecules, into different particles. So chemical reactions involve the rearrangement of atoms. You can't make atoms, you can't destroy atoms. So summarizing John Dalton's model of the atom, atoms are very, very, very tiny. Atoms are indestructible. They cannot be broken down into smaller pieces and atoms have no internal structure. They are just small particles. Nothing unique about those particles. They're just a solid particle. Fast forward to the end of the 1800s. J.J. Thompson is an English physicist who did experiments with what is called a cathode ray tube. And this was sort of a toy at the time but it's a glass tube, a sealed glass tube that has had all the air sucked out of it. So there's a vacuum inside. Most of the air has been pumped out, but then they insert different gases. You can put different gases into this tube and then it's hooked up to an electric current and uh, a beam appears. And they could play around with this beam with uh, magnets and you could make the beam bend. Now a cathode ray tube is, um, looks like it's this ancient piece of equipment, but in reality a cathode ray tube is what is used in older TVs and older computer monitors. Of course now we're all going to the, um, the flat panel televisions that no longer use the cathode ray tube. But a cathode ray tube is, you know, these big TV and monitors that we all used to use. I'm going to show you a video with showing the Crookes uh, tube, the cathode ray tube, in action. Uh, so hopefully you'll get to see this in class as a live demonstration. But if you don't get that chance, here's a video showing how, what goes on. To demonstrate a Crookes tube, a cathode ray tube, we need a high voltage power source such as this one. We need the Crookes tube, which has a metal cathode, a metal anode, a screen that has been coated with a phosphorescent material that gives off light when struck by electrons, and a bar magnet. As we turn on the screen, we notice that electrons are emitted from the cathode, and as they strike the fluorescent screen, we're able to see the cathode ray, this stream of electrons illuminated. We can use a magnet to show the deflection of that stream. Here we can see the electrons being deflected by the magnet. The cathode ray moves upward. If we reverse the magnet, we would predict that the beam would be deflected in the opposite direction. And we observe that the beam is deflected downward. So 
The result of using a Crookes tube, a cathode ray tube, allowed J.J. Thompson to theorize that there that that atoms did have pieces to them, did have particles within them that were negatively charged. So J.J. Thompson is credited with the discovery of the electron. He proposed that those electrons were embedded within the particle, like in this diagram you can see here. He referred to it as a plum pudding model. At the time, plum pudding must have been the dessert of choice. All I can sort of figure is that it's some sort of uh, pudding with the plums embedded inside of it. Uh, it's not a, obviously a dessert that we know of today, but if you could imagine raisins inside of a, a vanilla or chocolate pudding, hmm, I'm not sure how tasty that would be, but that's the idea of what he thought the atom was like. The atom, the, the pudding, was effectively a, a positive region, and that the electrons were the raisins that were embedded but could be removed. And that's what that green beam was. The green beam is the electrons that were that were ripped off of the atoms, and you could then see them fluoresced as the green beam. So J.J. Thompson, again, is credited with the electron being discovered, and he postulated that the atom was um, a, a, a plum pudding model, the positive sphere with the negative electrons embedded within. A student of J.J. Thompson was a New Zealand physicist in 1911 named Ernest Rutherford. He, since he was a student of J.J. Thompson, believed that the plum pudding model was correct. It was a working theory of the time. Um, all the evidence they had was pointing to that theory as being correct. Now as he was uh, experimenting, he had an experiment called the gold foil experiment that came up with some very interesting results that led him to further modify the atomic theory, the idea of what the atom looked like. Rutherford's experiment was uh, composed of a thin piece of gold foil, which you can see pictured here. The gold foil, picture aluminum foil, but it's not aluminum, it's made out of gold. Over here, this little cylinder is um, made up of uranium or some other radioactive source that's embedded within lead. Okay, The lead is meant to uh, shield the experimenter from the radioactive beam. And now this radioactive substance emitted something called alpha particles. Alpha particles are a positively charged particle um, that has a fair amount of mass to it. Um, it's actually a helium nucleus. It's got uh, two protons and two uh, neutron, so it's 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 fairly heavy, positively charged particle, and so what you can't see in this picture is on this cube there's a hole over here, on the face of this cube that you can't see that is allowing these alpha particles to leave the lead cube, and so therefore the alpha particle beam is being directed towards the gold foil. Now, um, what they then did is they took this substance here, the screen that was coated with something called zinc sulfide, and when these alpha particles hit the zinc sulfide, there's a little glow. It's a little flash of light. So they can tell when the alpha particles go through the foil, they can see where those alpha particles show up. Now, this slide further explains all the words that I just spoke. All right, so Rutherford's experiment uses the radioactive uranium, which produces a beam of alpha particles. Alpha particles are positively charged and heavy. That beam is aimed at or through a very thin gold foil, and the detector screen glows when hit by those alpha particles. To help you understand this and see this better, I'll show you a little video that helps, uh, the animation really, I think, helps clarify what this experiment was doing. The nucleus of an atom was first discovered when a beam of positively charged particles emitted from a radioactive source was aimed at a fluorescent screen. The particles caused the fluorescent screen to glow. When a very thin sheet of gold foil was placed in the pathway of the particle beam, a few particles were deflected to the side. 
Occasionally, particles were deflected straight back. But nearly all particles passed right through the gold foil, as if it were not there. The scientists concluded that atoms must be mostly empty space, and that because some particles are deflected, there must be a small positively charged central mass, which they called the nucleus. So from this video, and here's another diagram uh, attempting to explain what this uh, uh, experiment was about, those alpha particles should have gone straight through the foil if J.J. Thompson's model of plum pudding was correct. The positively charged alpha particles should have gone straight through. There should be nothing in those gold atoms that would stop those heavy positively charged alpha particles from going through. They should go straight through. But that's not what they saw. Okay, what Rutherford saw was that most alpha particles did go straight through, but some bounced back. So you can see here, most go straight through, but some were deflected. Some, you know, deflected off to the side, and some were almost bounced straight back. And so Rutherford had to stop and think about the current theory and, and explain what is it about these atoms that's causing these small it's causing these positively charged alpha particles from bouncing back. What's stopping them? What's making them bounce it back? So this is how Rutherford explained what he saw. All right, so if this is the nucleus, which is, again, this is the first time that this idea of a nucleus is being proposed. Rutherford's saying, okay, well, at the center of these atoms is a small, dense, positively charged core. And as the alpha particles come at the gold atoms, okay, so this is, this picture here is supposed to represent a gold atom. The lines represent the path of electrons, but that the electrons shouldn't be enough to, to, to stop or change the alpha particles from doing anything. So since the atom is mostly empty space in which the electrons can move, the alpha particles can go straight through. And so most of the alpha particles do, because there's really nothing stopping them. But if an alpha particle comes dead on to the nucleus, it's not going to go straight through. Instead, it's going to bounce back. If an alpha particle happened to sort of glance against the side of the nucleus, since the alpha particles are positive and the nucleus is positive, that's enough to just sort of make the alpha particle veer off, not completely bounce back. So again, most of the alpha particles go straight through if you, if you envision the atom to be mostly empty space, but just this small, very heavy, very dense, positively charged core, which he called a nucleus, would be enough that occasionally those alpha particles would hit it and bounce back in various angles, depending on the angle that it hit the nucleus. So in summary, Ernest Rutherford's model of the atom said that the atom is mostly empty space. The electrons move about in that empty space, but they're so small and occupy so little of that space that we consider the atom to be mostly empty, even though that's where the electrons are moving about. Okay, and that's what's shown here. These are the electrons moving about in what is mostly empty space. But here, this is meant to be the nucleus, which is very small, it's very dense, and it's positively charged. This is sort of a funny picture because uh, Rutherford is from New Zealand. This is one of their postage stamps. I just thought it was an interesting uh, picture <laughs> to show how they have um, recognized Rutherford for his achievements in, uh, for science. All right, well, so far we've seen uh, Dalton's model of the atom, we've seen J.J. Thompson's model of the atom, and we've seen Ernest Rutherford's model of the atom. It was experiments, first the Crookes tube or the cathode ray tube, and then the gold foil experiment that gave scientists evidence enough to modify the, the atomic theory of the time, and that evidence is what uh, allowed the idea of what the atom looked like to move forward. 
If you don't have the evidence, the theory can't change. So it's experimental evidence that allowed the evolution of the idea of the atom to change. Now these are three of the five models that we're going to study. The more modern models of the atom we will uh, talk about in chapter five.